Hello and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam and on this channel I will attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully it will whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video I'm going to be talking about esters, how they're created, and how to eke out some control of ester production. Before I get into the video though, I'd like to thank my Patreons, especially Chris Turner and Linton, and I'd also like to thank Dave for his donation. All of you are helping me out immensely and I can't thank you enough. So let's get started. Okay, so esters are a very well known class of flavor compound. Most of the ones we find will have a general fruity or flowery flavor. And that's mostly because the compounds you find in fruit and flowers are esters. Sometimes they may go in specific directions, right? Isoamyl acetate has a banana flavor to it. But you know, if you get the concentration a little bit higher, sometimes it goes into a more general fruity flavor. If you've ever had banana runts, this is what gives it the banana flavor. But then if you've ever had juicy fruit, this is what gives juicy fruit its flavor as well. But then you can go to something like ethyl butyrate and it has a pineapple odor to it. But the funny thing about ethyl butyrate is that it's made up of ethanol and butyric acid. Butyric acid though, in very low concentrations has a sort of a buttery smell but when you get to moderate and high concentrations, then it's very easy to get to those levels. It has a smell like vomit. So what makes an ester an ester is pretty simple. It contains a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and single bonded to another oxygen. Then the rest of the molecule spreads out from there. So most of the esters that are produced by yeast are either acetate esters or ethyl esters. You know, there are some others like propyl butyrate, which is also known as propyl butanoate, just different naming conventions. Propyl butanoate is uh, more correct, but propyl butyrate is more well known, I would think. Same goes for carboxylic acids, you know, butyric acid and butanoic acid. Same thing, just two different naming conventions. So technically there are two ways that esters are produced, enzymatically and then through non-biological chemical reactions like the Fischer esterification reaction. This is how most people learn about the production of esters through Fischer esterification reaction. If you go on to hobby websites about distilling or making beer or watch videos, a lot of them will refer to Fischer esterification, the reaction between an alcohol and a carboxylic acid in the presence of a strong acid. Contrary to what they're saying, the overwhelming majority of esters are actually produced enzymatically inside the yeast and not through a Fischer esterification reaction, either in the cell or extracellularly in the bulk of the wort. I want to preface the rest of this video by saying that a lot of the intracellular purposes of esters, so why do yeast make esters, is actually quite unknown. We know why they create esters and push them out of the cell. It's for things like attracting insects, so that the insect will pick up the yeast and carry it off to some other location. But why they create them for internal use, we don't really know yet. Also for this video, I'm really only going to be talking about the enzymatic process. Um, I'm putting the Fischer esterification reaction process in a second video, and this is because an overwhelming majority of all the esters that are produced are done enzymatically. And it's my opinion that, essentially speaking, almost no esters that you will find in your, in your wort, in your fermented wash, in your stripping run, or in your spirit run, are going to have esters of any even measurable quantity that are going to be produced due to Fischer esterification. So I've put it in a second video and I sort of give a rundown of how it works and why I think it's not working, but it's not really important for understanding ester production and control when it comes to fermenting and distilling. So let's get down to brass tacks and learn how enzymatic ester synthesis actually happens. Okay, so enzymatic ester synthesis can currently be broken down into multiple sets of enzymes, but generally they're under a class of enzymes called AATs, which stands for alcohol acetyltransferase or alcohol acyltransferase, depending on specific coenzymes, which we're going to be talking about later. But generally speaking, you can just refer to them as AATs, you know, if you're talking to someone else about this, or you can just say enzymes, whichever. So first, our acetate enzymes. 
Um, there are a bunch of enzymes involved in creating acetate esters. ATF1 and ATF2, EAT1, and IMO32. These are the ones that are uh, currently known. Who knows how many others there are. Down in the description, I have some more data on these, specifically how it relates to how much of certain esters they produce, if you're curious to see. But what happens when an ester is getting created? The first thing we need is these alcohols to be present. Most of these alcohols, like methanol, is created from pectin. It doesn't really matter whether or not it's aerobic or anaerobic it's still going to get produced ethanol though is only produced typically during anaerobic fermentation and the higher alcohols usually need to have low oxygen or no oxygen in order for the fusel aldehyde to be reduced into a fusel alcohol so generally speaking this entire process is really only going to happen under low oxygen or no oxygen condition that said the second component is called acetyl coenzyme a so the coa stands for coenzyme a it's a very very complex molecule so i'm not going to get into too much detail about it but it is produced by pyruvate just like how ethanol is derived from pyruvate so the yeast eats the sugar, the sugar goes into the glycolytic pathway, pyruvate pops out of that pathway. Under aerobic conditions, when there is oxygen, that pyruvate gets turned into acetyl coenzyme A and it goes into the citric acid cycle, which is also known as the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle. If there is no oxygen present or low oxygen, that pyruvate could get turned into acetaldehyde, which then gets turned into ethanol. But in this case, it's producing acetyl coenzyme A. The entire time from when the yeast wakes up after you've rehydrated it up until there's essentially no more oxygen left it's going to be producing acetyl coenzyme a because it needs it to make energy for the rest of the cell but this is all we need this alcohol and this acetyl coenzyme a i'm going to use isoamyl alcohol as my alcohol for this example so here it is isoamyl alcohol the alcohol group here at the end is what defines this as an alcohol color the h in red simply because it's the pertinent part of the alcohol and then down here we have our acetyl coenzyme a so this ch3 C double bond O is the acetyl group and it's connected to this coenzyme A. All that this enzyme does, the ATF1 and the ATF2, is it swaps the position of these two molecules. So the acetyl group goes where the hydrogen was, and the hydrogen goes where the acetyl group goes. So now we have an acetyl group on our isoamyl that makes this isoamyl acetate. And then the hydrogen is now on the coenzyme A, so they just call it coenzyme A. So now this coenzyme A can go off to become another acetyl coenzyme A, and this isoamyl acetate usually gets expelled out of the cell. And that's really, it really is that simple. Methyl acetate, ethyl acetate, isoamyl acetate, butyl acetate, hexyl acetate, all of them, essentially, that's all that happens. It's a little more complicated with the ethyl esters, so let's talk about them right now. Okay, so the other major group of esters is called the ethyl esters or the fatty acid esters or the fatty acid ethyl esters. It's just a naming convention. I mean, non-ethyl esters are produced this way as well. It's just that most of them are going to be ethyl esters made from fatty acids, and so that's why they use this naming convention. This pathway has an extra step over the last one, and it involves fatty acids, but not always, like I said. So fatty acids are just carboxylic acids that have four or more carbons. Because they have four or more carbons, they are usually less water soluble, or they can be water insoluble, so they can't dissolve in water at all, and they become more lipid-like, so they're called fatty acids. You may have heard of triglycerides. That's one of the most common fatty acid esters. It is three fatty acids connected to a glycerol backbone. So you have your acids and then you have your alcohol. Glycerol is a, it's called a sugar alcohol because it's an alcohol and it's slightly sweet. In fact, people sometimes use this in spirit making. So let's say they've made a, I don't know, a neutral and it's kind of harsh. You can put a few drops of glycerol in it and it might smooth it out. So in this case of fatty acid ester synthesis, the first step is that the, the fatty acid, in this case I'm going to use butyric acid, otherwise known as butanoic acid, gets combined with an acetyl coenzyme A molecule. And that turns it into what's called an acyl coenzyme A. So I talked about this before when I was talking about the AAT acronym, how it's alcohol acetyl transferase or alcohol acyl transferase. Well, that's where this comes from. So butanoic acid plus acetyl coenzyme A and you get butanoyl coenzyme A. Although you can use the name butyric acid instead with your acetyl coenzyme A, you get butyrol coenzyme A instead. I actually just looked this up. I didn't, I didn't think it was a thing, but it is. So then the next step is similar to the steps taken in with, with the acetate esters. You have your alcohol 
alcohol. In this case, again, I colored the H because it's what's going to be removed in this case. The, the coenzyme A and the hydrogen get combined and the, the butanoil gets attached onto the back end of this ethanol. So the line is right here. There's our ethyl group. So we have ethyl butyrate or ethyl butanoate. So yeah, this is our fatty acid ethyl ester in this case. But you know, it could be ethyl octanoate, it could be propyl butanoate. You know, it doesn't have to be an ethyl group and it doesn't need to be to butyrate. It could be um, some of the really long chain fatty acids. Like I said, oleic acid, it could come out as ethyl oleate, which would be a massive molecule and it'd probably be like that long. But yeah, so this enzymatic process, I forgot to put the enzyme in there. Where are we going? I guess the enzyme comes in over here. It would be EEB1 or EHT1. Trying to find the enzymes that do this, this step here, the acyl coenzyme A. I couldn't find them, but yeah, not that much more complicated than the acetate esters, just that one extra step. And you know, this works with all kinds of alcohols and with all kinds of acids. I don't think it does acetates, but it does everything else. But what we all want to know is how do you control all this? So let's get into the control and we can understand how we can increase or decrease the amount of esters that'll be present. Okay, so control can be a little problematic, but generally speaking, it's not too bad. One of the main problems is that it's difficult to control specifically acetate esters or specifically fatty acid ethyl esters. Essentially, if you're trying to control one, you're going to control the other. It's a package deal. The other problem is the small molecule esters that get produced. Ethyl acetate is one of the smallest, and the main problem with this is that once it gets produced, it is able to just diffuse out through the cell membrane. It doesn't need a carrier molecule or facilitated diffusion. It just passes out. And that's why it's one of the highest concentration esters that show up in your fermentation. But there are a lot of things we can do to try and limit the production of esters or to promote them. The number one is strain choice, right? If your strain has been bred to not produce a lot of esters, then you're not going to get a lot of esters in the first place, as long as you stay within the environmental conditions that are stated on the package of that yeast. As for environment and the composition of the wort or must, we can limit the amount of fusel alcohols being produced in the first place by using DAP instead of FAN as your nitrogen, and FAN is free amino nitrogen, so using amino acids, like isoamyl alcohol will mean less isoamyl acetate and less fusel alcohol based esters. Next, lower temperature. So if you lower the temperature, you're going to be lowering the amount of growth in general, but also the expression or the production of the ATF1 and ATF2 enzymes is actually correlated with temperature. So if you have a higher temperature, more of these two enzymes are going to be produced. So if you lower the temperature, less of these enzymes will be produced and less esters will be produced. The next one, higher dissolved oxygen will lead to less esters produced because dissolved oxygen is actually an inhibitor of the expression of the ATF1 enzyme. More dissolved oxygen, less of this enzyme is produced, less ester. The same goes for unsaturated fatty acids. You can usually buy these as part of a nutrient mix for fermentations. Usually it'll also include free amino nitrogen, but sometimes instead of that it'll include DAP, but this is not some strange thing that you can't find. All the major companies that make fermentation nutrients usually have a mix that contains unsaturated fatty acids. So again, like with dissolved oxygen, unsaturated fatty acids repress or inhibit the production of the ATF1 enzyme. Less of that enzyme, less ester. Next up we have higher sugar. So higher sugar means higher growth, but it also does the opposite of these two and it promotes production of the ATF1 enzyme. But not only that, it also promotes production of the ATF2 and all the, the other enzymes like IMO32, EEB1, EHT1, there's one more I'm forgetting, EHT1. T1, that was it. This promotes the production of those esters. Try to keep your sugar levels as low as you can and still get the ABV that you want, right? And specifically, glucose, fructose, and sucrose, in comparison to maltose, seem to increase the, the quantity of the esters produced as well. Maltose does not seem to increase those quantities, which is another possible reason for the idea that maltose, essentially sugars from malted grains, are healthier for yeast. So this last one, MRPs. So what are MRPs? MRPs are Maillard reaction products. And the most likely source is gonna be malted grains. So you've germinated your grains, you got to dry them out, they kiln them. And in the process of kilning them, you get Maillard reactions happening. And that's the reaction between a sugar and an amino acid. There's a whole bunch of different compounds it creates. One class of those compounds is called melanoidins. These are actually the coloring compounds that you find in, in your wort or in beer that gives it its brown color. 
turns out that these compounds can act as chelating agents. So what's a chelator? I'll give you an example. So say this is our, our melanoidin and this is a, a magnesium ion. Essentially when they get close together, they form a complex and this metal ion can no longer be used in whatever it needs to be used in. So in this case, the prevailing information seems to indicate that it's the magnesium ions that it's grabbing. Magnesium ions are cofactors for all these enzymes. So they won't work if those magnesium ions aren't there. That's a good thing if you want less esters. That said, a lot of the reactions in the glycolytic pathway, so turning glucose or fructose or galactose into pyruvate takes, I think there's four of the steps there take magnesium as a cofactor. Another one of the steps is pyruvate into acetaldehyde, I think also uses a magnesium ion as a cofactor. So generally speaking, if you're using less than around 20% dark malt in your grain bill, you probably won't have any problems because that seems to be the max that most beer makes use brewers and they don't seem to have very many problems I don't know if they've ever tested to see whether or not higher dark malt concentrations leads to slower or stalled fermentations and it turns out to be this is the case but if you're doing a really high concentration dark malt grain bill and it stalls out or slows down and it's not pH or sugar or nitrogen or temperature then you could add in some magnesium sulfate and that might speed things up something to remember so the last one is pressure fermenting. And this one really surprised me. So first off, it's not the pressure that's actually lowering the ester production. The result of fermenting under pressure causes the dissolved CO2 concentration to increase. And it's this increased dissolved CO2 that causes the drop in esters. It actually also causes a drop in higher alcohols or fusel alcohols, which also causes a drop in esters. So the reason this happens is that dissolved CO2 is both a growth inhibitor, but it's also an ester enzyme inhibitor. These enzymes are inhibited by higher concentrations of CO2. And the quantities of inhibition I've seen, or that I've read, I should say, from multiple studies are as high as 40%, just fermenting under pressure with higher dissolved CO2. This in combination with lower temperatures, people have been getting between 50 and 60% drops in ester production. That's a huge quantity. So this is something I actually really want to try out. Firmzilla makes a bunch of conical fermenters that you can use to do pressure fermenting and you can go as high as 2 bar which would be 15 psi over atmospheric pressure. That's pretty high. So yeah there are things that can be done to limit esters. I think the most important one is strain choice which is why I put a one up beside it. Temperature is probably going to have the next biggest impact so you know and I think pressure fermenting is going to be have the same impact as lowering the temperature. And then I can't really speak to the rest of these, but, you know, they're all going to come in. Well, this will probably be three. And then these are probably four. I'll make all of these four. Getting better at drawing curly braces. Okay, so choose the right strain. Ferment at a lower temperature if you can. And if you can pressure ferment, for sure, give that a try. Try and limit the amount of fusel alcohols you're producing. And then you can try all these other things as well. And you will limit the amount of esters you're producing. But you know, if you want more esters, obviously you start to do the opposite of this. Choose a high ester strain. Raise the temperature. Don't ferment under pressure. Lower the amount of initial oxygen. Not too low, but lower. Don't add any unsaturated fatty acids. Makes me wonder if you can buy saturated fatty acids and add that. Use more sugar. Specifically add in glucose, fructose, or sucrose. Use lighter grain products, non-dark malts you'll be able to increase your ester production. Or, you know, you could just buy a turbo yeast, put it in an insulated fermenter in a warm room, and you will have the least clean neutral that has ever been produced. But that's it for this video on ester production. Remember the other video on Fisher esterification is more about how it probably isn't happening. So it isn't important to watch unless you're curious about why I think it isn't happening. But make sure to check out the Patreon or PayPal donation link if you want to help out the channel. No pressure though. I hope you learned something. Please click like and subscribe if you want to learn more and have a great week.